Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Dermal Exposure Assessment, uh, brought to you in partnership with Nexum and SKC Europe Limited. My name is Jans Babkevic and I'm an occupational hygienist who likes to share the knowledge and learn about the best practices in workplace health protection from all around the world. I'm glad to see so much interest for this topic and I hope that everyone who joins us today will learn some practical knowledge that they will be able to apply in their workplace. So we have one and a half hours ahead of us packed with a lot of useful information and some exciting announcements. We will kick off with two presentations. First, we will talk about understanding dermal exposure in the context of occupational hygiene. And then we will move on to discussing some of the most practical dermal exposure assessment methods available to us. This will be followed by a short Q&A session. And at the end of the webinar, we will announce the launch of the Global Occupational Hygiene Training Support 2023 Bursary Scheme and inform you about the application process and eligibility criteria. We will keep this the, the chat box open to all our participants, so please keep the discussion going uh, during the presentation. OK, let's waste no time. Uh, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Nadia Mandi, who will talk about fundamentals of dermal exposure in occupational hygiene. Um, Nadia is a very passionate registered occupational hygienist and managing director of Nexam PTY Limited. She currently holds a master's degree from the University of KwaZulu Natal and has close to 11 years of professional experience with the occupational hygiene industry. Uh, Nadia also volunteers at the Southern African Institute for Occupational Hygiene, where she serves as the current president. Recently, her company Nexam PTY Limited has been recognized as an approved training provider by the Occupational Hygiene Training Association to train OHTA modules leading to internationally recognized qualifications. So without further ado, please welcome Nadia Mandi. Hi, and thanks. Hi all as well. Um, it's great to be on this platform. Um, and thanks for such a warm introduction there, Jens. Um, I will be sharing my screen now. So I'll be taking over. Okay, Jens, can I get confirmation that you can see my slides? All good here, yeah. Perfect. All right, guys, so uh, welcome. I see there's lots of uh, people joining and all around the globe. It's exciting to actually be presenting on a global level. Um, it's an honor ac actually for me. Um, and uh, as Jan says, I'm sure everybody that's actually on this uh, platform at, on this webinar is actually as passionate as I am and also very inquisitive um, in terms of, you know, uh, doing our assessments in occupational hygiene. All right, so getting into it and not wasting time because we've only got an hour and a half. Um, so we all know this and, you know, if you attend these OTA modules, uh, specifically the W201s, you'll actually, you know, get an idea and a feel for basics um, in occupational hygiene. And, you know, one of the things that they, they actually teach there is that the aspects of the skin, OK, and it is the largest organ. Uh, generally, the skin has about two meters squared in terms of mass and it's about 15 percent of your total body mass as well. Um, one of the fun facts is that the skin renews itself every 28 days and also it constantly sheds your dead cells. And that's about 30,000 to about 40,000 cells every to every minute. So that's quite a lot. Um, if you look here, the, the you know the skin's also referred to as an integumentary system as well. Um, it forms a physical barrier between your external environment as well as the internal environment that serves to protect and as well maintain. We also look at you know the biomechanical features um, of the skin, such as your strength, your pli pliability, your elasticity. 
When we talk about the strength, the pliability, its ability of, uh, to stretch, with elasticity, we look at aspects of the ability to recoil. OK, so that's, you know, you, you delve more into these auto causes and, you know, this training is limited for a time period. So, uh, you know, Jans and I had to, you know, specify and, and put down things that are most important to get our point across. So the skin gets its strength from a subtle outer layer called the epidermis, and it's made largely from dead cells packed with a hard protein called your keratin. The epidermis is continually wearing away and it always renews itself. Additionally, collagen gives the structure to the skin and elastin allows it for stretching. The skin functions is quite important here and you can see the various points that I have listed. OK, the one part being a barrier protection and that's your physical protection. As we delve into the, you know, the structure on the next slides, you'll see this photos indicating as such. The skin is tightly a knit network of cells and that defines its strength. You also look at it in terms of a thermal regulation. Your thermal regulation in this aspect is that it has a large surface area that is highly vascularized. OK, which allows it to conserve and release heat through vas vasoconstriction and vasodilation. OK, you know, these these concepts um, are explained in the thermal environments module for the uh, biota. But for those that just want a basic understanding, I'll, I'll provide a very simple definition. So your vasoconstriction are vessels that supply blood to the skin, um, uh, uh, to the skin's constrict or narrow in response to the cold temperatures. It also decreases blood flow to the skin as well. Your vasodilation, on the other hand, widens blood vessels, okay, and it allows the heat to be carried to that surface area. OK, so those concepts are very important when you discuss um, your functions. We also look at aspects of, you know, water preservation, OK, your endocrine activity, vitamin D synthesis, which is quite um, self-explanatory, OK, um, your immunological effector and your biotransformation of xenobiotics, OK, all these concepts are quite nice concepts to actually understand how, you know, chemicals are actually absorbed in the skin because they all play an essential component in terms of dermal exposure. OK, so, um, you know, sometimes you need to understand uh, uh, structures and functions when you look at photos. And, you know, the first photo you can actually see that it's it's looking at your epidermis layer. OK, and your epidermis layer is made up of what is often referred to as your block building cells. OK, um, uh, it's referred to as your uh, your uh, keratinocytes. OK, and the epidermis is divided into four layers. And those are your stratum basale, your spinosum, your granulosum, and your corneum. There are four important cells that are produced, and this is essential in understanding. Okay, you've got your keratinocytes, okay, and they're predominant cell types of your epidermis, and they originate in your basal layer, that top layer. They produce keratin and are responsible for the formation of your epidermal water barrier by making and secreting lipids. Lipids. Keep that that word in your head whilst I carry on. Carinitocytes, uh, okay, form the skin's protective barrier and are constantly reproducing to replace old or damaged cells. Okay, so that's one part of it. Then you've got your other second important cell, which is your melanocytes. OK, and they derive from neutral uh, crest cells and they primarily produce your melanin. And that melanin is very important for your pigments of the skin. OK, the third important cell is your Langerhans cell. OK, they refer to as your dendrit, dendritic cells and are the skin's first line defenders and play a significant role in terms of antigen presentation. And guys, lastly, your Merkel cells. They serve as a sensory function, okay, for like examples of light touch, okay, um, more so in your fingertips or through also your palms and your soles, okay, and oral and genital mucosa as well. All right, so we've done that aspects of dealing with our epidermis. Okay, we move on to the, sec the second layer, and that second layer is referred to as your dermis, okay? It's the skin's 
thickest layer. It's filled with a matrix of collagen and elastin proteins, and we briefly spoke about the importance of the strength aspect on the previous slide. They provide support, flexibility, and resilience, as well as several functional structures. The dermis contains your nerve endings, okay, your sweat glands, your oil glands or sebaceous glands, your hair follicles, blood vessels, and lymphatics. We move on to the third layer, and that's your subcutaneous layer, your hypodermis layer, okay, and it's a fat or connective tissue below the dermis. This layer helps to insulate and protect the internal organs, okay, and also stores fat for future use. These three layers are important for understanding dermal exposure because most measurements to understand or determine the exposure is based on the inhalation aspect, like we all know this. Okay, I've been to many industries where you often see employees immersing their hands unprotected into solvents, okay, but at the same time assume that they're being protected due to the compliance with wearing a respirator. Okay, all right, so almost like a double edged sword there. So point to consider here is that when the epidermis moisture content is too high or too low, it can compromise the skin's barrier. And that additionally, the skin, um, uh, if the skin's dehydrated, it can become rough, it can become thickened, it can become flaky and losing its subtleness, okay? So when the skin becomes too moist, it weakens that barrier function. So when we're speaking about dermal exposure, we're looking at the aspect of that barrier protection of the skin. Right. Um, also, you know, speaking about the, the workplace skin hazards, so what are the hazards associated? OK, so you've got your mechanical hazards. Um, and also what's nice to note is that this present this this webinar uh, focuses solely on, you know, the chemical aspect in terms of, you know, chemicals um, uh, 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 sitting on the layer of the skin. OK, but uh, what was needed is to also explain that there are also other hazards to the skin that could result in dermal exposure. And this is important to, to acknowledge. So one being is your mechanical hazard. OK, so mechanical insults to the skin on areas, example, your hands, your feet, your knees, your elbows, lips and necks. OK, so these include specific aspects of trauma and friction, pressure, vibration, pounding, abrasion and penetration injuries. OK, mechanical hazards can also cause irritant effects like I've stipulated on, on the slide, or it can also result in ad adaptive protective responses. So the irritant effects are either acute or chronic. Acute changes include urticaria, blisters, erosions, necrosis, burns or ulcerations of the skin. Okay, chronic mechanical insults lead to conditions such as vibration syndrome and deformities. These are some of the pictures, you know, after, you know, doing research and looking into specific journals, etc. You often see, you know, um, uh, uh, mechanical hazards uh, being experienced by employees. And one of them, if you look at the first picture and we're going from, you know, your from your left to your right. I hope I'm doing this correctly. So from the left to the right. OK, so you can see this individual um, and I should have actually labeled my slides, but, you know, um, when you when you're busy, you often forget things. So ulceration of the nasal bridge, you can see that with surrounding arrhythmia. OK, arrhythmia and scaling of the nasal tip, which is attributable to prolonged contact with the facial mask. OK, you can also see the next one with the hand showing transient uh, um, uh, palma hyper wrinkling resulting from pr prolonged immersion in water. OK, so that often, you know, experience that dryness. OK, and also if you look at the last one, your candidal erosion um, of, you know, your, uh, within the webs of your fingers. OK, and that's due to occlusion or maceration from protective gloves. Yes, so we've got PPE to protect us, yet it can also cause us harm. OK, so, you know, part of the slide is a part of this webinar as well. I wanted to in introduce the aspects of how PPE can actually impact on us in terms of dermal uh, exposure, but there's not enough time. But you guys, you know, that that's something to also consider and remember. All right, so moving on, you've also got physical hazards. OK, your physical hazards like your heat, your cold, your radiation, electricity, humidity, airflow and occlusion. OK. 
Accurate effects or damage include burns, okay, mali uh, area from occlusion and heat, acne, urticaria, and eczema, okay. Eczema, for example, is precipitated by dry environments, causing a skin eczema, okay. Chronic effects include cancers and skin cancers, for example, from radi radiation damage, okay. You also look at, you know, your physical hazards can cause irritant effects, but also must be recognized as a hazard modifier. OK, excessive moisture, for example, working in water for long periods like we sp spoke about earlier on as well. Excessive sweat can also cause irritation, OK, um, or increase the permeability of the skin. Sharp items, for example, breaks the protective barrier of the skin and increases the risk of infections. All right. For example, your heat, if you look at sweat, tech, a sweat tech stagnation, it can cause, you know, ruba, OK, which is small, itchy rashes, sweat rashes and prickly heat that we often speak about. You know, normally these are dealt with at thermal um, environments cause for OTA. Heat and physical exercises may cause heat uti uh, uticaria, non-allergic hives. Um, I've experienced these things. All right. Intense heat can also cause burns. All right. Cold temperatures, for example, can result in vasoconstriction, narrowing your blood vessels, like the concepts we just dealt with earlier. Okay, and this could result in your Raynaud-like symptoms, where you often have blanching attacks on your fingers, sometimes to frostbites as well. Okay, ionizing radiation is also used widely in medical imaging and therapy. Okay, um, you often see it also including X-rays, etc. Okay, X-rays and gamma radiation can penetrate deeper and can harm your inner layers. OK, so the skin symptoms, you know, after a short period or high level of exposure, to, for example, to ionizing radiation can, you know, can actually result in acute radiodermatitis. OK, while the effects of long term exposure summarize as chronic radiodermatitis. All right. And then, guys, you know, you can move along the aspects of, you know, getting into, you know, explaining in terms of acute uh, dermati radiodermatitis and chronic uh, radiodermatitis. OK, but uh, th those are concepts that I leave for you. OK, non-ionizing radiation concerning occupational diseases, workplace exposure to ultraviolet radiation. OK, it's an most important physical risk factor. OK, it's necessary, although your ultraviolet radiation is necessary for human body to produce vitamin D, excessive exposure is harmful. OK, it can damage your eyes. It can also cause mutation of the DNA and also can suppress immu uh, immune responses. Accurate effects of ultraviolet radiation ranges from skin, then red rash, arrhythmia to various levels of sunburn. Chronic exposures can result in pigmentation, photoagent, okay, solar uh, keratosis, all right, skin cancers as well in terms of chronic exposure. Subjects to um, uh, 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 people who experience it, for instance, would be those that are, you know, working outdoor in those outdoor environments. Also, those that, you know, are welding, UV lamps, lasers used in medicine, industries in terms of, uh, you know, various trades. And, you know, some of these pictures I had to, you know, place on as well so you guys understand the degree of exposure. And you can actually see that uh, malaria, ruba, okay, one type of heat rash appears in clusters of small little inflamed blister-like uh, bumps on the skin. Okay, and it is, it is very um, uh, uh, painful, right? Raynard phenomenon also um, manifests as a recurrent uh, vasospasm of fingers and toes, usually occurs in response to the stress of cold exposures. Okay, you can actually see that blanching there. We also look at aspects of biological hazards, and this ranges from viruses through bacteria, fungi, and parasites, animals, as well as plants. All of these are potential biological hazards. Biological hazards have either a direct effect on the skin or they have an, or they actually act as vectors. OK, your vector can also result in um, via an association where byproducts are left in the environment and act as an allergen or sources of infection. OK, so you often see in terms of infectious, you've got fungal infections, your mycosis, OK, which are your yeast infections. You've got uh, aspects of your dermophyte infections like your ringworms. OK, generally you'll see this, uh, you know, occurring within animal handlers or veterinarians, farmers. OK, 
viral skin diseases like your mycas nodules okay cause um uh, uh, by, by you know a source of uh, handling um cows udders okay sheep and goats all right um parasitic uh, skin lesions for instance um are, are sometimes not recognized and they, also, they they have an occupational origin specifically when animal parasites like mites are common in agricultural workers um uh, environments bee and wasp uh, wasp things are also important concepts here often you know you'll see sugar uh, uh, industries often are uh, you know um, impacted with a lot of bees in those environments or so bees and this and the wasp things are important concepts to actually acknowledge and understand in terms of dermal exposure however you know uh, those are things that you know you, we need to develop and we need to ensure that that's educated to people when you educated to the employers when you're actually doing these assessments all right so that they know it's not only inhalation that's actually a risk it's also your dermal exposure to employees and that's something that actually needs to be controlled all right these are some examples you know i was spe uh, speaking about this with the ones lately as well you know athlete's foot for example on the picture on the on the left hand side at the top there i suffered a lot um when i was um, in high school i was uh, an athlete and i used to participate in a lot of um uh, uh running events etc um and uh, because of my feet being, you know, in tackies a lot and that moisture build up and the humidity build up, I often suffered with athlete's foot. So those infections, you know, are very important to, to discuss and understand because it can actually spread from one person to another via touch. OK, also, you can see the second picture here is, you know, um, your your ringworm and then your bee sting situ situated at this and the last picture. So those are what those actually look like. Right. Um, then, you know, you also have hazards that have uh, pre-existing skin um, that occur with pre-existing skin conditions and pre-existing skin conditions offer a real challenge for occupational skin diseases assessment and management. OK, you often have like a topic eczema, fair skin or psoriasis are themselves potential hazards and they refer to often as hazard modifiers. OK, workers with damaged skin barrier are often more predisposed to contact dermatitis than those with normal barrier functions. OK, fair skinned people working in an outdoor environment are more susceptible to long term effects of chronic radiations Okay, than darker skins. Patients with psoriasis, for example, may develop chronic plaques okay, over areas of trauma such as the palms and your soles. OK, so those are things that we need to remember and understand as well. Then we move on to what you know this webinar is all about the chemical hazard aspect of it okay so chemicals can directly irritate the exposed skin strong irritants such as your nitric acid your sodium hydroxides um, can cause changes in the skin very quickly okay and then you often you know you come across aspects of sensitization on the slide some chemicals like we know uh, can sensitize the skin by altering the skin's radio uh, uh, reactivity through stimulating allergic responses all right and then often you know you see certain hazards chemicals such as lead beryllium uh, pah pcbs pesticides can be transferred from a work site to the worker's home via clothing and can contribute to elevated levels in the blood and urine as well all right so i hope you guys are, are catching on these fundamental concepts and you know uh, this uh, this nice introduction in terms to understanding how dermal exposure can actually translate into someone's work activities okay moving along as well some of the photos your direct effects as you can see here can cause a problem at the point of contact these effects can, are called direct effects you can actually see on the second picture here with the hand showing here okay drying some chemicals remove the natural oils of your skin causing it to become very dry and the most frequent causes of dry skin are exposures to soap your solvents and your moisture okay leucoderma as well also called um, uh, your acromoderma is a clinical sign describing a localized area of white depigmentation skin due to the loss of your epidermal melanin and you can see it in this last photo here on the side okay often you see this you know when you come across um, industries that use azo dyes okay they are often used in textiles leather articles and some foods and contact with dif different azodiles is also known to produce contact dermatitis as well. 
some chemicals, for instance, also, if you think about, you know, being exposed to silver can actually change the color of your skin. You know, you often see that sort of blue transition to gray. Hey, um, uh, they often call that agaria. So, so that's your hyperpigmentation also in terms of aspects of that. Um, so those are concepts we need to understand. It's not always aspects of inhalation, it's also aspects of dermal contact. And then I saw it fit to actually place in the examples of occupation with dermal exposures. Hopefully it's quite um, big on your screen on, on that end, but I can see it on my screen here. And, you know, you've got your exposure, your chemicals, your abrasions, your sunlight in terms of exposure. And they actually simplified and, and, and talk about what which workers are actually potentially at risk and what skin diseases are actually associated with this type of activities or, or handling these types of um, various uh, hazards. So in terms of chemicals, for instance, your pesticides, your solvents, your, your PAHs are some main chemical groups that have been recognized as posing health problems by dermal absorption. Pesticides generally have a very low volatility and the amount of the material is inhaled is likely to be low unless it's sort of a vigorous application is performed. Okay. If you look at like example, like I've come across this a lot when I do my assessment, solvents that are used in thinners, your degreasants, your paint coatings, etc. You know, whether you use ethanol and isopropanol, your, your toluene, your xylene, okay, or mixtures of these, okay, are known to be toxic, okay, to a very uh, to, to a number of target organs within the body, like your example, your kidneys, your liver, and your nervous system, because they actually impact on that systemic aspect, okay. They also may produce long-term irreversible damage to the central nervous system. Okay, many other materials can also be absorbed through the skin. Okay, these include your mercury, your isocyanates, your, your PCBs, your acrylates. Okay, even pharmaceutical uh, drugs or products can actually absorb into the skin. You often would be associated in terms of skin diseases or you know health effects. You you come across aspect you come across terms such as irritant contact dermatitis, okay, and these are aspects of irritant uh, where you often you're working with either water or wet work cleansers or detergents, alkalis, oil or grease or, or greases, all right, uh, various metals as well, um, dyes and biocides. With urticaria, often you'll see a skin condition that consists of hives, like you've seen in the pictures earlier on, okay? Um, contact urti urticaria is a different form of dermatitis. Um, and also, you know, like I've mentioned before, skin cancers. There's, there's one slide that I was contemplating in putting in, inputting, but I, we just don't have enough time to explain everything. And it's actually quite nice. I was very excited doing this presentation. But, you know, your PPE is of great value to prevent contact with irritants, allergens, or even chemicals, microbial agents, etc. But it can also be a problem, all right? And uh, uh, through the development of a contact allergy to one or more of its components or irritant contact dermatitis, prolonged occlusion from rubber gloves, okay, often can create um, uh, uh, a moisture in that environment and actually can result in dermal um, exposure. Also, you know, if you talk about sweating, when the individuals are sweating, uh, facial PPE like you saw as well, uh, those are all aspects that you have to also, you know, start in, including in your risk assessments. The exposure route and effects. So in an occupational environment, um, hazardous exposures are generally governed by work activity and the toxicity of an article, right? So those are two common things that we'd have to always remember. Dermal exposure is defined as when a tox toxicant damages the epidermal tissue or is absorbed through the epidermis and enters the bloodstream. Remember, exposure route is a way that a contaminant enters an individual or population after a contact. OK, also it occurs via direct applications, splashes, spills, contaminated surfaces. You'll often see that the degree of exposures will differ between established economies in what we call developed and develop, developing countries. Example, direct use of hands as working tools is what I often see using the uh, uh, equipment. OK, and working under less regulated occupational safety requirements. OK, this is this is common uh, uh, conversation for us here, OK, which I often assess. All right. Um, also, in terms of effects, like we like briefly touched earlier on on the previous slide, you've got direct skin effects, your immune mediated skin effects and your systemic. 
okay. And we all know what direct skin affects, okay? It's basically, you know, your local effects such as irritation, narcosis, and corrosion. So I'm not going to spend too much of time on that because I can see I'm running out of time. And also, you know, you've got your dermal exposure may also lead to chemical sensitization, okay? And this occurs through a complex immune responses or processes. Okay, once sensitized, exposure may lead to an allergic reaction, okay? Either uh, contact dermatitis in terms of an allergy or urticaria or asthma, all right? We also move on to, you know, your, um, your systemic toxicity, which occurs when the skin exposure contributes to the overall body burden, resulting in other organ toxicities. Systemic effects are the effects that normally occur away from the portal of entry after a substance has been passed through a physio uh, physiological barrier like the skin and has become systemically available that it's entered. That means it actually enters your systemic circulation. OK, so those are important aspects to deal with. And, you know, not by uh, although we're looking at occupational exposures, but, you know, in non occupational uh, settings, people can also be dermally exposed to chemicals. And you can actually see that in it's it, it's experienced in a wide range of consumer products. OK, so I'll leave that homework for you to do. I can explain it further, but I don't want to overstep my, my time limit here. And then, you know, occupational skin diseases um, from dermal exposure uh, and occupational skin disease is a skin disease that is caused or made worse by work related exposure. Most common forms are allergic or irritant contact dermatitis, urticaria, your nail disorders, uh, leukedema, loss of pigmentation, acne, infections and cancer. All right. And I've left some stats for you guys here to like actually just um, absorb. OK, in South Africa, uh, in most African countries, it's either underreported, underdiagnosed, or you know, most uh, people don't report this because they're not informed um, as to what to do or what measures to undertake. So those are things that you know you have to acknowledge and accept as well. Pathways to the skin absorption. Okay, these are quite nice to deal with. Your intercellular, cellular, your transcellular, and your transependial um, uh, routes of uh, uh, pathways to the skin. So intercellular absorption consists of the chemical diffusing uh, around the cornea sites through the lipid-rich extracellular structure, st structure, and it's the major route of permeation. Transcellular absorption is absorbed chemicals transferred through cornea sites, partitioning in and out of the cell membranes and intercellular lipid layers. Okay, compounds permeate through this route, utilize imperfections in the cornea sites and create openings comprised of water. All right. Your appendial absorption consists of absorbed chemical bypassing the cornea sites and traveling through the shunts provided through the sweat ducts, like your hair follicles, sebaceous glands, etc. All right. So the skin, you must understand, is an active organ providing protection against pathogens. If the above mentioned that I've just spoke about now overcomes the barrier of layers of the skin, they are no longer capable of regenerating and the skin diseases occur from that result. OK, I also mentioned permeation earlier on. So what you must understand here is that dermal absorption is primarily dependent on the outermost layer of the epidermis. Dermal absorption is defined as a passage of chemicals from the outside of the skin into the systemic circulation. All right. Consideration of three processes are important to understand your penetration, your permeation and absorption. Diagram actually, actually explains it quite nicely. Penetration is when the entry of a substance uh, into a particular skin layer or structure, okay? Permeation looks at which um, is the passage of a substance through one layer of the skin into another. And reabsorption, okay, is which is uptake of substance into um, your dermal blood or your lymph capillaries entering directly or indirectly systemic circulation aspects. We also have placed this picture uh, on as well, and it's something that I'll quickly go through. Um, only small molecules, usually less than 500 Dalton, okay, in terms of molecular weight and uh, lymphophilic compounds can penetrate the skin barrier. Uh, your low molecular weights uh, chemicals um, uh, have good solubility in both water and fat penetrate the skin more readily lar than larger ones, okay, or hydro um, highly hydrophilic or high highly lipophilic compounds. But you must remember that the re reduced integrity or barrier dysfunction of the skin through factors such as physical or chemical damage may increase dermal absorption of chemicals, leading to the entrance of larger molecules such as proteins. Toxicants move from the stratum corneum, 
by passive diffusion, and there are no known um, active transport mechanisms functioning within the epidermis. Often you have these terms that they talk about your polar and non-polar toxicants, which diffuse through the stratum corneum. Your polar compounds are water soluble and appear to diffuse through the outer surface of the hydrated um, keratinized layer. Your non-polar compounds, which are your lipid soluble, dissolved and diffused through the lipid material between your keratin filaments. So remember here, the most common solubility parameter is the octanal water partition coefficient, okay, which is your KOW. That means maximum absorption is often associated with log KOW values between one and two and decreases significantly when the log KOW value is greater than 3.5. Okay, and that was actually, you know, derived from the European Center for the Ecotoxicology and Toxicology of Chemicals. All right, and, you know, uh, uh, I think Jans might tackle a little bit on this when he's explaining to you different measures, but that's basically what you actually center around. OK, so examples of chemicals that are used in the workplace for dermal absorption plays a significant role in overall uptake is your glycol ethyls, your, phen your phenols, your aromatic amines, like I've mentioned earlier on. Also, inorganic metal compounds or nanoparticles, for example, your dermal exposure to solvents has also been shown to reduce the barrier function of the skin by altering the lipid and the protein structures, structures of the stratin corneum. OK. Um, so, you know, organic solvents, your detergents can affect your, your skin barrier. Also, adequate hydration is important, but if you've got excess of it, it can lead to a reduced barrier function. OK. Um, Patients suffering from atopic dermatitis can also reduce the ceramide content on the skin, could, which could increase your, your, your skin um, uh, exposure. All right, so those are things that we can, you know, acknowledge as well. And, you know, there's various chemicals that you can actually research and go through as well, like, uh, you know, arsenic, your, your heptachlor, your t uh, tetra, uh, ethyl lead, et cetera, et cetera. Dermal absorption, recap for substances to uh, transdermally absorb, some key elements must uh, take place. The substance interacts with the stratum corneum, diffusion of the substance through the stratum corneum, crossing from a lipophilic stratum corneum to a more aqueous, viable epidermis, continuing, continuing from an avascular epidermis to a highly profuse dermal tissue, and up to, uptake through the microcirculation to the systemic circulation as well. Exposure limits, and I'm sorry, Jens, I'm going above time. I'm almost finished. Your exposure limits, there's no OEL for dermal exposure, okay? So often it's very hard to quantify and explain, all right? Um, your skin notations have also been assigned to various substances, okay? So generally, you know, you've got about at least 14 federal regulations and agencies like your EPA, your FDA, your OSHA, et cetera, that are involved in um, regulating the occupational skin exposures. Um, uh, efforts to control, you know, in the past, your workplace exposures were mostly focused on inhalation rather than um, your skin exposures. And as a result, you know, uh, determining or, you know, everybody agreeing to a specific assessment strategy or method um, is quite hard, okay, and not commonplace. So chemicals um, with a risk associated with dermal penetration are given a skin notation, like I've just mentioned, okay, and it's guidance to warn against potential increased risk of systemic toxicity. Okay, remember, the major intention of a skin notation is to identify a substance that can contribute substantially to your total body burden by uptake via unbroken skin, right? I have spoken about, you know, risk in terms of pre-existing conditions, but they, they, they word here, uh, which is a very important technology, is unbroken skin and can cause serious systemic health effects, all right? Factors relevant to the assignment of skin notation, the amount of substance in direct contact with the skin, uh, your phys uh, physical chemical properties of the substance, like your lipophilicity, your molecular weight, like I spoke about as well, your fertility, your concomitant exposure to a, to a vehicle or other chemicals that may enhance the rate of penetration, and duration of exposure, the physical form of that substance, okay, just like other risks, the duration aspect of it. In many cases, the OEL for inhalation is used to measure your dermal exposure, and that's often used as 10 uh, 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 meters cubed per day. And the dermal OEL equals your inhalation OEL times your 10 meters uh, cubed per day as well. And Jan will actually, you know, elaborate on that concept in his presentation. Okay, 
So um, how to measure in terms of how do we measure dermal uh, exposure? You've got inception, which is your, you know, your patches. It's, it's uh, placing dermal dosimeters or the form of patches or pads, glove or whole body suits against exposed skin or clothing to collect contaminants. OK, you've got removal um, techniques. They include washing, wiping or taping and, and, and stripping and suctioning, remove the chemicals from the skin and the removal metals, metal, um, methods are particularly suitable for substances remaining on the screen for a long period of time. And then you've also got visualization techniques, OK, like your fluorescent tube, uh, your, your fluorescent um, uh, materials um, in terms of measurement. Um, with that being said, I think I'll just stop here and uh, that's um, concluding uh, this slide and this presentation. And I'd like to hand over um, to Jans. Um, I would like to also announce our second speaker, Jans uh, Babkovich, who will talk about the practical ways to evaluate your dermal exposure. Jans is an occupational hygienist with a strong uh, background in um, chemical manufacturing, uh, asbestos abatement, oil and gas, uh, industries. He holds uh, BSc honors in occupational health and safety and um, uh, and the environment from the University of Greenwich and an MSc in occupational hygiene from the University of Manchester. Jans is a licentiate member of the BOHS and is a holder of the certificate of occupational um, operational competence in occupational hygiene. Jans also has for 10 years experience in occupational hygiene and is currently working as an in-house hygienist for an agrochemical manufacturing company, Sagenta, in Huddersfield, England. So with that being said, let's all welcome Jens. Um, and Jens, um, I hand over to you. So Vicky. Thank you very much, Nadia, for this introduction. And um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's so informative and it might seem like we talked about a lot but really we just scratched the surface um no pun intended of the skin exposure um there's so much more to it and you know unfortunately um all all, all focus is on inhalation exposure but it is in our hands to change it and the more, the more we talk about it the more awareness we bring and uh, the more change we can make so in my presentation, I'll focus more on practical methods of you know, how we can actually carry out thermal exposure assessment. Um, but you know, wh why do we have to worry about thermal exposure in the workplace? And I, I think Nadia's presentation perfectly answered this question. Um, but, but if I am to reiterate one important point, it is that the skin is the biggest organ in humans uh, and uh, it has the second largest surface area after the lungs. Uh, the skin is definitely not the impermeable membrane that once was thought to be, and many workplace chemicals can easily penetrate the skin and enter the bloodstream. So we do need to think about dermal exposure, and it should be assessed in the same way we assess our inhalation exposure. So I will present you with two most practicable exposure assessment methods. Uh, one will be purely qualitative and relies on our observations. And another is semi-quantitative and relies on taking some actual measurements. So let's start with the first one, qualitative dermal exposure assessment method. So qualitative assessment is interpretation based and descriptive in nature. We don't measure things, uh, but we observe the parameters, make professional judgment and assign a scoring criteria to arrive at the final conclusion. A strategy for assessing and managing occupational exposures published by the AIHA offers us such a qualitative assessment method uh, that is based on six dermal exposure risk factors. These are dermal contact area, dermal concentration or dermal loading, dermal contact frequency, dermal retention time, dermal penetration potential and dermal hazard rating. Uh, knowing these, uh, knowing the first five risk factors allows us to characterize the exposure potential which can then be coupled with the hazard rating to determine the overall dermal risk rating. 
So let's examine in more details each of these six risk factors. Okay, let's take a look at the first risk factor, dermal contact area. Exposed unprotected skin is a potential pathway for dermal absorption and the more unprotected skin surface there is, the higher is the exposure potential. Uh, for example, spray painting in your shorts with naked torso will result in higher dermal exposure than spray painting in whole body coveralls with gloves uh, on and only a small area of the face exposed. So what we need to do here is to observe the task with dermal exposure potential and decide if the contact area is very small, such as small percentage of the hands, moderate hands and forearms exposed, or significant you know, hands, arms, face, torso, and legs exposed. So the more exposed surfaces there are, the higher will be the risk rating. Next one on the list is dermal loading or dermal concentration. Uh, this is how much of the hazardous material is deposited onto the exposed surface of the skin. Not all of the deposited material will be absorbed into the skin. However, the potential dose increases with increased dermal loading. So ideally, you would want to measure this amount of material that gets deposited onto the skin. And we will talk about it, how you can do it using semi-quantitative assessment method. But for now, we can qualitatively decide if the deposited amount of material is low, moderate, or high. Okay, on to the next exposure risk factor, dermal contact frequency. So basically, we observe the entirety of the task to determine the duration of actual exposure. It is somewhat similar to determining a trigger time when doing hand, hands arm vibration assessment. So someone working eight hours with power tools um, does not necessarily mean that you know, the person who works eight hours with power, power tools will be exposed to vibration for eight hours. So a task with thermal exposure potential might take one hour, but the actual exposure time when the skin comes in contact with the substance may only constitute 25% of the task. So making that judgment and assigning the appropriate risk score will help, will help us to resolve that risk factor. Next risk factor we need to talk about is dermal retention time. The, the length of time a hazardous substance remains on the exposed skin is very important as it will determine if the substance had a chance to penetrate the outer layer of the skin to reach the viable layer where it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. Highly volatile substances uh, will evaporate rapidly and would not be allowed the opportunity to penetrate the skin. On the other hand, st uh, sticky, non-volatile non substances will stay on the surface of the skin longer and will, uh, and will be allowed enough time to make their way through the skin into the bloodstream. So look at the properties uh, of the substance, such as dustiness, stickiness, volatility, and molecular weight to assign the right score factor score for this risk factor. Now let's have a look at dermal penetration potential. As previously mentioned, the skin is not the impermeable membrane. However, it does provide a significant barrier for hazardous substances entering the body. Uh, many substances are capable of penetrating the skin and some can do it more easily than others. A hazardous substance has first to cross the outer layer of the skin, which consists of dead cells and skin fat. Uh, once past that, that bar this barrier, a substance has to be absorbed into the viable aqueous layer of the skin, where it can enter the bloodstream. Uh, therefore, substances that are both lipid and water soluble has the highest penetration potential, while those that are insoluble or poorly soluble in water or fat have lower penetration potential. 
And finally, the last risk factor, dermal hazard rating. So here we examine all available toxicity data for the substance in question to determine how hazardous it is to workers' health. These tox data can be found in the safety data sheets, NIOSH Pocket Consultant, or in the European Chemical Agency dossier database. If previous five risk factors determine the exposure potential, this last risk factor evaluates the potential health consequences of overexposure. So a substance such as phenol that presents a life-threatening toxicity will be given the highest dermal hazard rating, while something like um, isopropyl alcohol that may only cause reversible skin irritation will be, uh, will be given the lowest score. Once we have qualitatively evaluated five dermal exposure risk factors, we can multiply them to determine the overall dermal exposure rating and plot it on X axis of our risk matrix. We then plot our dermal hazard rating on the Y axis and connect two axes together to determine the final dermal risk rating. Similar to other risk rating matrices, the level of risk will depend on both the level of exposure and the level of hazard. So to lower the risk, we should either reduce the hazard by substituting for a less hazardous material or introduce some additional controls to reduce the level of exposure. OK, so that's our qualitative assessment technique. Uh, but now let's move on to semi-quantitative dermal exposure assessment methods. And here, instead of simply observing the risk factors and applying our professional judgment, we actually aim to measure the level of skin exposure to determine the risk. This method consists of four steps. First, we need to establish the dermal exposure limit to know what we are benchmarking against. Second step, we need to evaluate dermal loading by undertaking dermal, um, dermal exposure monitoring. Um, step three, we determine dermal absorption by using some modeling tools. And finally, stage uh, step four, we compare our absorbed dose, dermal dose against the derived dermal exposure limit to see if exposure is acceptable. OK, let's have a look at step one, establishing dermal exposure limit. Unfortunately, health protection authorities seldom set exposure limits specifically for skin exposure, and the vast majority of exposure limits is set for inhalation exposure only. However, there are some exceptions. Under REACH regulations, substances that present systemic toxicity through dermal exposure will have a derived no-effect level, DNL, specifically for dermal exposure. These limits are expressed as milligrams per kilogram by body weight per day, and they can be adopt adopted as dermal exposure limits. Uh, bear in mind that dermal DNLs are describing the potential exposure dose rather than the actual amount of the substance that may come into contact with the skin. So if you are to adopt these dermal DNLs as dermal exposure limits, you would need to make sure that you measure exposure levels on the outer surface of protective clothing rather than on the exposed skin. Another approach that can be adopted for deriving a dermal exposure limit is to conver convert the existing inhalation exposure limit so inhalation OELs are based on the total internal dose that can be received through inhalation over the working day without any adverse health effects. Inhalation OELs are expressed in milligrams per meter cubed over eight hour period. So we can calculate the maximum allowed internal dose by multiplying the inhalation limit by 10 meter cubed, which is the average volume of air inhaled over a working day. And this will and this way we will arrive at the, at the dermal exposure limit.
Okay, step two in our semi-quantitative dermal exposure assessment is to evaluate dermal loading or dermal concentration. Um, there are three common techniques that can be used to assess dermal loading. These are removal, interception, and in situ technique. A removal technique involves physical removal of the deposited material from the exposed surface of the skin onto a wipe or washing it off using a, spe a specialized solution and collecting the washing liquid in a bag for the analysis. In situ technique includes adding a fluores fluorescent tracer into the handled material and then subjecting the skin to the UV light to determine the level of contamination by measuring the intensity of the tracer color. The third technique, and the one I will be focusing on today, is interception method. For this method, we attach some sort of absorptive medium onto the exposed surface of the skin to intercept the material that gets in contact with the skin. The, the idea here is to imitate the surface of the skin. However, there is no one type of absorptive media that could exactly replicate skin properties. So we are left with various surrogates. But nevertheless, they are sufficient to complete skin exposure evaluation and draw some meaningful conclusions on the level of risk to workers' health. Let's take a look at how we can apply interception methods to assess dermal loading. Uh, once we selected the most suitable sorbent medium for the substance we want to evaluate, we need to observe the worker to identify exposed skin areas that may come in contact with the material. Here we have a hypothetical scenario where the worker is digging into the ground contaminated with phenol for two hours. Once the exposed areas of the skins uh, are identified, we, we need to attach a representative amount of sorbent media to intercept the exposure. The key word here is representative. Ideally, you would want to cover the entire surface of exposed skin with sorbent media so that 100% of deposited material is captured. However, in practice, this is seldom practicable. You need to look for a compromise and cover a reasonable amount of skin that will allow the extrapolation to the entire exposed surface area. To make it representative, we can divide the exposed parts of the body into distinct sections, such as hands, wrists, forearms, shoulders, forehead, etc., and to attach at least one sorbent patch to each of these distinct areas. Once these representative areas of the skin are covered with absorptive patches, the work task can go ahead and the material is then collected onto these patches for the duration of the job, thus monitoring thermal exposure. Once the job task is complete, we remove the exposed patches uh, and submit from, from the skin of the worker and submit them to laboratory analysis to determine the concentration of absorbed material. Once we know the concentrations, we can start to extrapolate the results onto the entire surface area of the skin. So, for example, if the surface area of the sorbent media patch is three and a half centimeters square, and we have taken two samples from the forearms, then we have a total sample skin surface area of seven centimeters square. We know from the analysis that the total intercepted concentration on this seven centimeter square patch was 6.3 milligrams of phenol. So what we do now is we extrapolate this concentration onto the entire area of the forearms that is 1460 centimeters square. We do that by dividing the total skin surface area by the sorbent media surface area multiplied by concentration. So the extrapolated dermal loading for the forearms will be 
1,288 milligrams of phenol. Then we repeat the same calculations for each section of the exposed skin and sum them together to calculate the total dermal loading, which will be 4,865 milligrams of phenol per 5,580 centimeters square of exposed skin area. Once we have measured the dermal loading, we can estimate how much of that hazardous material will actually penetrate the skin and enter the bloodstream. The IH Skin Perm Dermal Absorption Modeling Tool can help us to do that. Uh, the tool was developed by the AIHA Exposure Assessment Strategy Committee, and it is an interactive spreadsheet in which the user sets the uh, scenario parameters and inputs physical chemical information for the substance, the exposed skin surface area, and the characteristics to estimate dermal absorption. For our scenario, I have calculated the dermal deposition rate by dividing the dermal loading by exposed skin area uh, divided by, exposed, by exposure time. So our dermal absorption rate is 4,865 milligrams of phenol divided by 5,580 centimeters square of exposed skin area divided by two hours. So it is 0 0.44 milligram per centimeter square per hour. Now, once all the parameters are entered into the model, we can run it to estimate total absorbed dose. Just to remind ourselves, the total absorbed dose will depend on the chemical properties of the substance, such as molecular weight, vapor pressure, water solubility, octanal water partition coefficient, density and melting point. So it is important that we correctly enter these parameters. The IH Skin Perm software will have a pre-populated database of common chemicals with uh, skin exposure potential. But if you are assessing a new substance, you would need to make sure the entered information about the chemical properties is correct. Okay, so our model gave us the outcome and it is estimated that a total of 2,000 990 milligrams of phenol will be absorbed into our worker's body over two hours of exposure. The last step is then to compare the estimated absorbed dose against the previously established dermal exposure limit. Um, here we have a total absorbed dose of almost 3,000 milligrams of phenol against the dermal OEL of 78 milligrams per day. This is a very clear case of dermal overexposure, and we should stop this task and seek specialist advice to resolve this case. Right, so we learned about qualitative and semi-quantitative dermal exposure assessment methods. Now let's apply them to this real-life case study that I've came across in my line of work. Uh, in this case study, I evaluated dermal exposure of uh, offshore workers who are working on the drill floor uh, in oil and gas sector and who are exposed to oil-based drilling mud. So basically, it's like a metal working fluid on a much bigger scale. For the preliminary assessment, I used our qualitative method by observing the task and scoring the risk factors. The majority of risk factors were given the highest score, and the conclusion was that qualitatively, the risk to health from dermal exposure was high. To better characterize the risk, I then decided to proceed with semi-quantitative assessment so first, I established a dermal exposure limit by examining the safety data sheet and finding out inhalation OEL for the oil-based mud. The resulting dermal OEL was uh, determined at 3,500 milligrams per day. 
Next, I evaluated dermal loading by attaching a number of absorptive patches to exposed skin areas. Uh, for this assessment, I chose Permia Tech patches with activated carbon bed because they were capable of capturing and retaining oil-based mud that was primarily an organic substance. Because exposed workers were doing this task for the entire duration of the day, it was, it was not practicable to attach absorptive patches directly to the skin as they frequently wash their hands and the sweat could dislodge them. So instead, I attached these patches to the undergloves worn below the main gloves. This allowed to collect all material that would normally be deposited onto the skin while allowing workers to take off their gloves and wash their hands between the breaks. At the end of the shift, workers returned their undergloves and I removed all patches to submit them to a laboratory for a GC analysis. Once the results came back, I have entered them into the IH skin perm software alongside all physical chemical properties of the oil based mud to determine the absorbed dose. Uh, the IH skin perm database did not have the material uh, that I was trying to assess, so I had to manually uh, enter all the parameters of the oil based mud. Uh, but luckily, I was able to locate all of them in one place in the chemical dossier submitted to the European Chemical Agency. I ran the model and the model told me that a total of 87 milligrams of oil-based mud was estimated to be absorbed into workers' body. The properties of this material were such that it was not a particularly penetrative to the skin. Out of 360 milligrams, of deposited material, only 24% were absorbed, but nevertheless, it was significant enough to be evaluated. Luckily, this substance had a relatively high exposure limit and 87 milligrams of absorbed material only equated to 2.5% of thermal exposure limit. In this case, systemic absorption did not present a major concern and the focus was shifted on direct skin effects such as irritation and sensitization, as well as inhalation exposure. And finally, I decided to combine exposure data from both exposure pathways. I took my dermal exposure absorption estimate and combined it with inhalation exposure data to calculate the total exposure dose. As you can see, inhalation exposure was the main contributor to the total dose, so 14% of OEL, while dermal exposure amounted only to 2.5% of OEL, resulting in a total received dose of 16.5% of exposure limit. Right, now that we learned all that information, let's do a quick recap. For baseline surveys, use a simple qualitative exposure assessment method. So this is your tier one um, dermal exposure assessment method. Semi-quantitative method is useful when there is a significant risk of systemic absorption. Interception method can help us to quantify uh, dermal loading. However, it will not um, be suitable for all chemicals. Uh, the IH skin perm is a powerful tool that can be used to estimate dermal absorption, but it relies on uh, inputting correct uh, data. And finally, dermal absorption can be combined with inhalation exposure data to calculate the total exposure dose. I know we covered a lot of information over the past. Uh, 60 minutes, and this is really just a taste of what is available for dermal exposure assessment. I would highly recommend to explore further material published in Chapter 13 and Appendix 2 of the AIHA Strategy for Assessing and Managing Occupational Exposures book, 
and to watch a practical dermal exposure assessment guidance published by the MedFast on their YouTube channel. Okay, so before we move on to the Q&A session and the exciting announcement about the launch of the bursary scheme, I would like to give this stage to our partners who supported this great effort to bring free education and made this project a reality. Uh, I would like to hand it over to Keith, Ka to Keith Emery, who is a sales development executive at SKC Europe Limited. So Keith, the stage is good yours. Afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Very good presentation, Jans. Um, this is just a brief uh, message from uh, SKC. Um, we at SKC Limited are especially proud to be funding in partnership with the great trainers at Nets and PTY Limited, the OHTA W501 measurement of the hazardous substances training module, and also examinations for three successful applicants. We couldn't be more pleased to support the next generation of occupational hygienists. So just a brief introduction about SKC. Um, for over 40 years, SKC Limited has been specialised in the manufacture and supply of air sampling equipment. So you may well already know us for air sampling pumps, uh, flow meter calibrators, also um, sampling media such as filters and sorbent tubes. But apart from air sampling solutions, you may not know that we also have products for skin and surface contamination, hand arm vibration exposure equipment, and also noise exposure equipment. And we can also provide practical one day training courses in air sampling in the UK. We have all dates available this year. And as a company, we can also offer servicing, testing and calibration and repair of our equipment. We're probably also best known for our comprehensive technical guidance and support. So currently available is the SKC Global Catalogue for 2022-2023. It's, it's available online for download um, or hard copy, and it contains both USA and UK occupational hygiene sampling methods. And we also have a hazard search on our website. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So does air sampling tell the whole the full story? Well, as this presentation today has proved, no, it doesn't. And um, as a company, we can provide you some tools to help you do your uh, risk assessments. So we have surface and skin swipes, which give you a qualitative colorimetric measurement. So they are actually change color in the presence of various um, chemicals mainly isocyanates, aliphatic amines, aromatic amines. And we also have the Permatec breakthrough indicators for gloves, which uh, Jans has used in his presentation. You may not also know that we do decontamination solutions, uh, both for surfaces and for uh, skin. The detailed skin cleansers are a formulation that can re remove um, hazardous chemicals from the skin without harming the skin and perform much better than normal soap and water. Um, for further information about these products, please visit our website, <coughs> excuse me, www.skcltd.com, which gives contact details of our main offices in the USA, and we also have offices in South Africa and in Asia. You can also find on our website uh, details of our global distributor network. Many thanks for your time today. If you wish to contact us, um, my contact details will be at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, with great pleasure, I would like to give the stage to our second partner and the one who supported the idea of the bursary scheme at the very early stage. So I would like to hand it over to again to Nadia Mandi, who is again to remind you the managing director of Nexum PTY Limited. So Nadia, this stage is yours. 
Thanks, Jens. And thanks, SKC, as well. So, guys, I'd just like to let you know um, this wouldn't have been done without these two partnerships. I mean, SKC, thank you for the funding, uh, part funding for these for these courses and for the three students that we're going to actually support in gaining a career. And Jens, um, I don't think I can thank you enough. You've supported a lifelong global dream that I've always lived. I mean, I often like supporting, you know, where where my reach often is, is within South Africa and Africa. Um, but you've provided me with a platform that's global. So I have to thank you. And it's um, you continue doing what you continue to do. I mean, you know, I will support you all the way. And that is why, you know, Jans and I have agreed as well as SKC. You know, we've we've also named the bursary because and we've at the end we've titled the 2023. That means next year. Um, I will still continue to support the next round of bursaries. Um, so in 2024, so you look forward to that as well. And I'm looking forward to that. So Nexum uh, offers a range of services and my passion is education. Uh, as you can see from my delivery, I love educating. I love imparting knowledge. I love engaging more so. And, you know, with that being said, um, Nexum derives from the word Nexus. It, it derives from the word of connections and the connections I make with individuals like you guys. So I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, gaining that connection with all of you. Um, it doesn't have to be in a, in, you know, in a professional manner or anything of that sort. It can be just you know, forging friendships and forging supports because that's that's what we actually you know need to support each other in this in, in this you know this hard world of ours. Um, and yes, you can actually see Jan's displayed, you know, the auto modules that I'm actually running this year. All of these are online to accommodate those that cannot afford to travel and to actually, you know, uh, find ways of actually uh, finding accommodation because those are very expensive. So I've offered and, and Nexum has been one of the, the ATPs to be allowed to offer these online courses. And uh, so, guys, you're more than welcome to have a look there. You can also link up with me on my LinkedIn page. Um, Jens, I think that's about it. You guys can look through there. Um, next slide there, Jens. And, you know, I often don't like ending off to say thank you, although I'm very grateful. And you can actually see that from my, you know, my delivery. I often like saying things, you know, with a with a positive message. And that's act as if you act as if what you do makes a difference. And it does. So, so guys, I, you know, listen to that statement because that's what we need you we need you there and you know Jan's SKC and myself are giving back you guys also have that opportunity to give back as well my details are on there as well please send me an email uh, connect with me my my website is currently um, uh, uh, being uh, redone uh, so um, if you access it you might see it under it's under construction uh, give it time because I've got lots of things to manage um, but yeah an email and uh, that number that you have displayed there's also a whatsapp number so you guys have all means to connect with me for any reason whatsoever so thank you Jans thank you SKC and thank you to all the I think over 400 people that are actually sitting online uh, it was a pleasure delivering to you thanks Nadia thank you very much um, okay, uh, looking at time and being conscious of it, our Q&A session may shrink from 15 minutes to five minutes, uh, but guys, you know, if you do have questions, and I saw people already putting them in the chat box, uh, we will go through them and we will do a follow-up to answer these questions. But if you do have a burning question, please leave it in the comment, uh, you know, in the comment box now, in the chat box. We'll have a look and maybe we can answer two or three before we move on to mm -hmm. announcing the uh, the bursary scheme. Um, someone here, that was quite easy to answer. Uh, someone asked me to, um, there we go, to repeat um, what media and analytical process was used in my case study. So the media that I used, uh, I mentioned it was Premier Tech tech parts, but they don't have to be, you know, specific brand. Why I chose them? Because what they offered is a carbon bed. So it's uh, activated carbon or charcoal patch. Uh, so it is, you know, if you think about collecting um, inhalation sample, you have your tube packed with carbon. Uh, and But the same is uh, with the patch. It has carbon. So because oil-based mud, it was organic material and that patch was able to absorb it and retain it 
I chose that. And uh, for analytical methods, uh, I use GAST chromatography, mass spectrometry. Um, but I, as far as I remember, I specified it as total VOCs as toluene. So it's kind of a semi quantitative uh, qu um, method. So, yeah. Um, let's see what else we got. I know there was a question about radiation. Um, and uh, yes, uh, you know, often with radiation, we, we utilize the maximum permissible exposure uh, limits there. So um, it wasn't something that we actually focused entirely on this presentation. So you know, you guys can actually just go read through those and actually look at that. It specifies laser, laser radiation. So, uh, and those often look for the, your eye exposure and also your skin uh, thresholds as well. So, yeah, it's it's quite easy to look through as well. Um, I don't know how accurate it is, but, you know, dermal and laser monitoring in terms of exposure as compared to your inhalation aspects is still, you know, being researched. Uh, I got one here from Amar. Um, he says, I recently encountered a CNC machine shop where gloves could not be worn because of the snag hazard. Uh, they were offered barrier cream instead. Oh. Do you think barrier creams are effective at minimizing dermal exposure? Um, yeah. So he, here, uh, really, my questions would be, why why do they present snag hazard? Are they, are they, are they the right size? Are they the right model? Uh, because gloves that fit well, they should not present any snack hazard. And the work, the work, it's easy to say without seeing the tiles, but the work should be designed in a way that you know no hands should really come into part in in contact with the rotating parts. But selecting right size gloves uh, is is very important. Um, but in terms of barrier cream, Nadia, do you have any opinion on barrier cream? I do. I've I've done a lot of research into those, and I've actually witnessed it, uh, where barrier creams actually enhance your uh, exposure to uh, skin uh, disorders. So in some instances, it does because it allows um, aromatic um, uh, amines to get through faster. So guys, it's research. Remember, barrier creams also require a safety data sheet. And that data sheet needs to be looked at as well in terms to see whether there's a KW, KOW factor in it or, you know, the vo volatility factor uh, applied to it as well. So, you know, use it with caution. And like Jan says, uh, we shouldn't use that to protect our hands. We should actually be using PPE. And, you know, I actually also spoke about aspects utilizing PPE and the hazards associated with the use of PPE as well. So it's just about information and education uh, and also using things, you know, uh, with safety. Yeah, I, I I agree with you. With I think the cream is good to restore your skin fat after work. You know, after you spend day at work uh, in protective gloves, and then you know after you washed it a few times to restore natural skin fat. But to use it as a layer of protection, um, that's a no from me. Um, I have another one from Buffy uh, that says. I'd love to know which I'd love to know which chemical agents are capable of causing skin cancer melanoma. I'm aware of ionizing radiation, but not much on chemicals. Historical skin exposures of benzene from gasoline or crocidolite, perhaps. Um, right. With this one, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, which is a byproduct of um, organic substances combustion. Can cause that, and that's why um, firefighters firefighters have higher incidence of skin cancer because all that soot um, gets onto the skin and can cause skin cancer. Uh, but with crocidolite, so crocidolite is is blue asbestos. Uh, mm. It the I never heard that it can cause skin cancer, but what I do know that it can cause skin warts. Uh, so basically yeah. a foreign material getting into the skin and then you have like a scar tissue build around it, but it is non-malignant. Uh, it, it's not causing cancer. So basically it's just a reaction of your skin to a foreign body. Um, 
but also yeah, think, if you, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting you but also if you look at like cdc and you look at the nice pocket guard or you look at you know various profiles you can actually just go it, it's it's so easy to find things that can result in a systemic effect and uh that could result in uh, you know uh, cancer, skin cancers. So, like you've said, I agree with you as well. And there's there's a whole lot of chemicals that can actually do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sorry guys, we cannot answer more questions because we need to move on and respect respect the the time that we set on this webinar. So, I'll move on to the exciting part of the webinar and um, the part where. I would like to announce the launch of the Global Occupational Hygiene Training Support 2023 uh, bursary scheme supported by SKC Europe Limited and Nexam PTY Limited. Um, so this round of applause. <laughs> so this training support scheme uh, offers a total of three bursaries that will cover the full cost of training and exam fees for the OHTA W501 measurement of hazardous substances module. Uh, the reason why we chose this specific module is because it will enable successful applicants to embark on the pathway of becoming a chartered occupational hygienist under the BOHS framework. We know that the, the first step can be the most difficult uh, one financially. So with these bursaries, we want to enable those people who otherwise would struggle to enter or advance their profession. So the application process starts tomorrow on the 3rd of February and it will last for 16 days until the 19th of February. Um, during this time, all interested individuals uh, need to submit their CV alongside 250 words motivation letter to ohta.bursary at gmail.com. Don't worry about the details. We will send the confirmation after the webinar with, with, with quick summary. So if you want, you write it down. If not, you will receive a summary with application details after the webinar. We wanted to keep the eligibility criteria as wide as possible to make sure we don't exclude deserving individuals. So the course will be delivered as distance learning. So applicants can be from any country. Uh, also, you don't have to be working or studying in the field of occupational health and safety to apply for this bursary. If you are able to demonstrate that this bursary will help you to make a transition into the OH, uh, then your application will also be considered. Um, we have made some restrictions, though, uh, to make sure bursaries are awarded to those who will benefit from them the most. Uh, so applicants with any existing OHTA modules or recognized hygiene credentials uh, will not be eligible. And the selection committee will consist of SKC Europe, uh, Nexum represent uh, uh, SKC Europe and Nexum representatives, uh, plus myself. And the consideration will be given to geographical demand for hygienists, applicant socioeconomic background, and how this award could uh, potentially enable or advance um, the career. Um, we will announce the successful applicants on the 28th of February, and you, and if you've been selected, then you should receive an official letter confirming the award. Uh, as I said, don't worry too much about remembering all this application process information, mm -hmm. as it will be forwarded to you after the, the webinar alongside the recording. And this takes us to the end of our webinar. Uh, I shall mention that all registered participants will receive the recording of this webinar with a short summary about the bursary application process in the next few hours. Uh, and also all participants will receive their certificate of attendance within a week. So keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, but before we finish, I want to say that I'm incredibly grateful for the level of interest this webinar generated and for so many attendees today. Uh, at some point, I saw 485 attendees live, meaning that we have so many like-minded individuals from all over the world uh, who devoted their lives to workers' health protection. When I look at this map of registered participants, 
I realized that uh, workplace health is without borders and we should promote it no matter where we are. Um, look, we have someone at uh, Tromso here in Norway above the Arctic Circle and then we have someone from uh, Punta Arenas in Chile close to Antarctica in southern Patagonia. Uh, and then we have someone from Christchurch in New Zealand and a person from Nanaimo in, in Canada. So, you know, guys, you're amazing and your support enables us to run these free educational webinars and offer financial support to those in need. So thank you very much to each of you okay. for attending today and sharing the information about the webinar and liking and commenting on my LinkedIn post that helps a lot to promote the webinar. We are truly wholesome international community of devoted individuals, and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And also big thanks to Nexum and SKC Europe who supported this initiative and helped to make this idea a reality. Um, Nadia, Keith, is there anything you would like to say to our listeners before we wrap this up? I would just like to say a, a big thank you to yourself and Nadia. Um, it's been a pleasure for us to take part and um, we hope we can help the uh, future occupational hygienists. I have m I don't have much to say. I've said it already and I just want to thank you all for making the time and making us feel important and listening to us. So it means the world to all of us that you guys actually have attended and that we haven't, um, you know, wasted valuable information. We actually have instilled and imparted and we will continue our fight for occupational hygiene around the world and health as well. Thanks, guys. Thank you both, guys. Um, you on much. this note, I would like to say thank you for joining the webinar and I, wish, I want to wish you all the best in your career and always uh, stay thoughtful and stay curious. Goodbye now. Bye.